kind of go ahead and get started. So good morning and good afternoon, depending where you are. And welcome to this Open Generation Roundtable discussion today. My name is Brian Zelli, and I'm speaking from the MITRE Ingenuities uh, headquarters in McLean, Virginia. Open Gen's government liaison program allows a dialogue between members and government leaders who are also stakeholders in 5G and our use cases. We have had a number of roundtable meetings with government leaders throughout the past year. We've met with representatives from several offices in the DOD, the FAA, NSF, and NASA. Most recently, last month, we had a roundtable discussion with Art Heinemann and Chris Nassif in FAA's UAS Integration Office about small UAS operations and their communications requirements. So this month, we're going to change things up a little bit and have a really interesting discussion of operations and use cases at a state agency. The Massachusetts Department of Transportation's Aeronautics Division has a robust UAS program and is promoting use cases that require communications links to support operational capabilities, including beyond light of sight operations. 5G mobile communications are expected to be a key enabler of these capabilities and use cases. For example, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, or MBTA, operates a large network of commuter rail and rapid transit operations. And they recently received a 40 mile BV loss waiver, and they're excited to use UAS to monitor their, their rail net network. Um, the MassDOT Administrator, Jeff DiCarlo, Chief Scientist, Scott Ubelhart, and their team will provide an overview of, math, of the MassDOT, excuse me, the MassDOT UAS mission and what lies ahead. We will then have a Q&A question. I kindly request that you use the hand raise feature if you'd like to ask a question, and please identify yourself and your organization when called upon. I also request to mute your microphones until, until you are ready to speak. Recordings of our meetings are available for OpenGen members and non-members to view. If there are any government representatives who you would like to see in a future roundtable discussion, please let us know your discussions. And with that, I am going to introduce uh, Jeff DiCarlo, the Administrator, and Chief Scientist uh, Scott Ubelhart um, to, get, to get us started. So over to you. Thanks so much, Brian. Really appreciate it. Um, it's fantastic to get a chance to uh, uh, reconnect uh, with MITRE Ingenuity. It's been about four months now, I think, since we last spoke and and really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to make some new friends, including from industry and industries that really intersect with what we're trying to accomplish here, um, as you will see, uh, as you will see. Next slide, Scott. OK, uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'll do a little intro here um, and then get right into um, some of the meat of the matter. So we're really, really fortunate to uh, be at uh, what many would consider a nexus of innovation uh, in Massachusetts and um, with partners such as uh, industry, academia and government that include Raytheon, Draper, General Dynamics, American Robotics um, and of course partners and folks that we've been working with intimately, MITRE, Lincoln Lab, Volpe Center and of course our really strong partner mass autonomy and mass robotics um, helping us out in many many ways mit um, is uh, certainly uh, from an academic perspective as well as at the laboratory um, we work hand in hand with them on a regular basis as well as northeastern umass amherst lowell dartmouth um, and uh, and then of course uh, the active duty military the national guard um, the um, and the FAA New England region, which is really supportive of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, if you start over on the right hand side of this uh, this slide here and you uh, for those of you that um, aren't acquainted with Boston, Boston in just the you know less than 10 years that I've been there has has actually really changed. Um, you have the Kendall Square Innovation Hub, which connects to, you know, the uh, Boston proper, which now um, has been sort of filled in at the Boston Seaport uh, with a lot of innovation entities. So you have this innovation cluster that, you know, is is one of the finest you could find. Um, and then around the, the Commonwealth, we have a lot of partners, um, including the Costas Research Inter uh, Institute up to the north run by Northeastern. Uh, we are very closely aligned with the Air Force um, at Hanscom, as well as uh, the Army at Natick. And uh, we work um, a lot at our test ranges. We see some of our new air partners. Hey, Ken, I believe Andy's on. Um, great to see you. Um, we are, uh, you know, we're, we have been working with new air for years. We apply for the test range together. 
Um, we're part of that um, with New Air. So it's a New York, Massachusetts partnership. Really happy. The ranges uh, that we work with uh, New Air on are Joint Base Cape Cod. We're doing a lot of work with Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, we work a lot at uh, Union Point, the old Weymouth Naval Air Station, and Devon's an old uh, Army Fort. Um, and we extend our operations out to the west, uh, working with uh, UMass Amherst. They have one of the, great, uh, the greatest radar shops you could find for research and development. And then working with the Guard and the, uh, the Reserve out to the west. Next slide. And um, so when we when we got this thing cranked up, you know, I arrived back in 2015 and we as we got things moving, one of the reasons I actually came in was to get involved with the the um, the UAS programs. And um, one of the things that we tried to do was to align our operations and operationalization um, across the um, the different offices within the state. This this. Um, graphic depicts a lot of the executive offices. We're part of DOT. We were subsumed in 2009. We have two separate programs. The drone program, unmanned and autonomous systems program, didn't exist before I arrived. Um, because of the great team, we've been able to grow that to be significant. We work with the government agencies that you see in the, the core uh, circular uh, area there in the graphic. and. Um, so we work on not only transportation use cases across, for instance, where our bubble is, the Aeronautics Division, Highway, Rail and Transit, Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, but through a lot of other executive offices that um, may or may not be um, involved at all in the transportation area, including the Department of Conservation and Recreation under Executive Office of Energy and um, in the Environment, and um, Housing and uh, Economic Development offices, and uh, a host of others. And then we also work with quasi-governmental agencies. And so we actually thought very practically how, how we could implement UAS from day one. Next slide. Um, our drone team partnerships, we've really firmly established these over the years. And we're very excited that um, we're able to, you know, work with uh, organizations um, within our own ecosystem as well as folks outside of our ecosystem, uh, specifically the NASA's um, and the like. So we've got a very strong partnership. This is just a highlight of some of them. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that we've done is, and, and this, I knew we would have to do it when I arrived on, on uh, location, was we are a state agency. And in order to do some of the things that I knew would have to be done, we needed to be able to align ourselves with an entity that could bring together industry, academia, and government with funders and development organizations. And we've successfully done that. It took us some years to you know, build the model for it. And then uh, for the last two years, uh, mass autonomy has been stood up by, by actually industry and really has been helping us to advance the state of the art um, and bring together really a nimble construct that allows us to solve a lot of transportation uh, pro uh, challenges and advance the state of the art working across industry, academia, and government inside and external to our um, ecosystem as well. Next slide. And I'm gonna hand it over to Scott. Pleasure to be here. All right, thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, thanks so much, Brian, uh, for inviting us. Um, again, I'm Scott Eubelhart, Chief Scientist for the Mass Aeronautics Drone Program. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is really kind of you know, a, a fairly large, if, if quick, overview of our entire program. Initially, focusing on you know, you know, the operationalization that we're doing today. We are flying every single day to support not only transportation but other use cases across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, talk a little bit about that, and then kind of go into really kind of the more innovative technologies, including beyond visual line of sight and other. Uh, other missions for which we obviously you know, have a strong need for, you know, communications and control uh, and, you know, 5G type of solutions. Uh, but let me kind of dive in first to talk a little bit about who we are and what sort of missions we're flying. We really kind of, again, stood up uh, five years ago uh, with the idea of having kind of the two, you know, two key uses. For one, let's facilitate the adoption of drones across Massachusetts in a way that brings immediate value to the Commonwealth. You know, I don't sit here necessarily as kind of, you know, an R&D researcher. 
you know, we are an operational unit of MassDOT, and we're looking to uh, understand how we can, can provide real value back to MassDOT Aeronautics, MassDOT Highway, MassDOT Rail and Transit, the MBTA, and other state agencies, you know, really immediately. So there's a very kind of strong operational mission that's at the core of everything we're doing. On the other side, we also do recognize that there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of growth for new types of innovative technologies. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're also working on is how do can we begin to kind of incentivize more than near term technologies? I'm not looking five, 10 years down the road. I'm looking two, three years down the road. How do we begin to incentivize and begin to kind of bring those into our overall program? And so this is kind of going to be the overall, uh, almost the overall structure of how I'll even talk about what we're doing today. First, a little bit about you know, what we're flying today and next about how we're trying to kind of look to the future. Uh, very quickly, you know, this kind of gives a sense of you know, just what we flew last last year, last fiscal year. Really kind of a, we have a team of, you know, five, six you know, pilots, you know, fleet of uh, aircraft, you know, kind of a complete a fleet of various sensors from EO, you know, EO, thermal, multispectral LIDAR systems. And really kind of flying a variety of use cases for a variety of customers across the entire Commonwealth. Just kind of showing some quick snapshots here that really kind of demonstrates you know, our work for the MassDOT Highway uh, Division, you know, the MBTA, Rail and Transit, as well as kind of other state agencies. That uh, picture in the middle is uh, some flying we did for the Department of Conservation and Recreation, trying to kind of capture uh, gulls on one of the reservoirs so they could count the number of you know seagulls you know on the uh, uh, on the water uh, so you know ton of activity uh, and really kind of a deep experience not only in flying these operations we have a you know top-notch set of uh, you know professional uh, remote pilots in command understand kind of the tools and understand the aircraft uh, but really are really kind of embedded very very closely with you know, all of these kind of end users across the rest of transportation and other state agencies to kind of get a sense to understand what they really need. And I think that's one of certainly our very early lessons learned is that it's very easy to talk about, you know, we're going to use a drone to fly a bridge. It's much more challenging to really understand, well, what are those bridge inspectors doing today? How do they see the world? What tools do they use? And ultimately, if we're going to change their workflow and introduce drones, how do we do that to make it really kind of value added? So that's a lot of what we've gained after the last you know, five years of operations. Um, kind of talked a little bit a bit. Okay. Um, uh, again, talked a little bit about the diversity of use cases uh, that we have. And just sound check. I just want to make sure I'm still on because I heard something odd a moment there. Yeah, we hear you perfectly. Loud All right, clear. thank you. Um, Again, supporting highway, rail, and transit aeronautics, doing a lot of work with emergency uh, management as well. Uh, so not only is aeronautics traditionally responsible to oversee the 35 uh, public and private use airports across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but again, Jeff DiCarlo in his capacity is also the lead coordinating agency for air operations for any emergencies that may occur. So that really also places us in an emergency role uh, across the state. And we've kind of you know, you know, accomplished that in several ways. Uh, you know, give, give some examples here that certainly might be relevant. Certainly in any sort of a aircraft emergency or aircraft accident, we tend to be really you know, some, of the, some of the first on the scene, working very closely with the federal NTSB investigators to kind of understand, you know, you know, certainly what happened, but also using drones to kind of map those areas and really kind of get a sense for, you know, what did that final flight path look like? A lot of kind of great information that we're showing there. Um, but also perhaps kind of even relevant for, you know, this audience, is really kind of working also with other emergency responders in order to uh, in order to kind of show how we can begin to live stream um, uh, information and video to those command centers. The image I'm showing here is an exercise actually that you know, we participated in. This was an exercise in which we, they were simulating what would happen if a aircraft actually overshot Boston Logan Airport and landed in the water. We had you know, our system flying right at Logan Airport you know, really kind of live streaming that video to the incident commander. Uh, this I think, shows uh, two things about our entire program. First off, what I mentioned is of interest to this crowd is we certainly have that need for really kind of improved live streaming video across all the various stakeholders that would be involved in these sort of uh, incidents. We have a solution right now, a little clunky, looking opposite, you know, looking for other solutions out there that allow us to kind of again, again have that kind of very kind of fast live streaming video to you know many people, especially also at many different levels of uh, uh, levels within the state and local government. 
you know, some of, some of the existing solutions are really kind of aimed at the people that already have a you know, state login credentials. We also want to push this to the local PDs, the local fire departments, for example. This slide also directly shows the strong relationship we have with the FAA and really our ability to kind of also operate across, you know, all the environments and all the airspace across the Commonwealth. You know, a lot of these flights were taking place right at Logan Airport in a kind of a Lance Zero grid. We were able to kind of get you know, permission to fly for this uh, one uh, this one emergency exercise operation. But also some of those yellow images are a subsequent uh, flight that we did actually for more PR purposes, actually documenting the arrival of a large crane for uh, the Massport organization. So we're really able to kind of fly very close to, you know, those uh, large airports and have a kind of a strong experience operating in complex environments. Um, you know, along with all of the operations we have in terms of understanding the aircraft we're flying, you know, we also from the very get go recognize that data is the, really the foundation for everything that we're doing as a drone program. And so we've also had a very robust data program from the very beginning of our overall drone program. You know, initially focused very much on how do we kind of plan our missions and kind of approve our missions. You know, that we have a very kind of centralized structure where our uh, operational lead really kind of reviews and approves all missions, you know, prior to them being flown. Have been working at understanding how do we kind of process and store all of that information that we're collecting, mostly imagery, in a large data lake. And it all kind of focused particularly on really kind of improving our ability to kind of not only analyze the data, but disseminate that data. And this is really kind of a key need, particularly across, you know, uh, state agencies which perhaps aren't as used to kind of using these GIS tools and these large data sets. And so we're spending a lot of time, again, working with our you know, end users, our customers, so to speak, across those other state agencies to understand what their needs are and what's the best way to really kind of share and kind of involve them in the process. So we're looking at a lot of, ex a lot of activity happening in the uh, data side of things. So kind of very kind of quickly, obviously went through our overall operations, what we're flying today, you know, really to kind of support uh, transportation. I'll kind of now uh, turn and pivot a little bit to talk about more of those innovative operations, innovative technologies that we're beginning to kind of bring on board. And, you know, for this, we really kind of have established uh, our Commonwealth UAS Integration Program or QIP program, kind of, you know, based on, you know, a lot of our initial uh, work, you know, applying for the FAA's Integration Pilot Program. Our QIP program has four key pillars including you know, enabling UAS, so that would be including uh, you know, beyond visual line of sight, counter UAS, recognize from the beginning that there's a strong role that we have as a state to understand you know, what is the potential threat you know, of UAS, particularly to our uh, airports and kind of other activities, as well as advanced air mobility and our testing training facilities. I'll spend most of my comments, particularly given the time, on the first two, on enabling and counter, and touch very briefly at the end on advanced air mobility and test and training facilities. For enabling, uh, but all this also kind of, you know, uh, um, you know uh, is enabled by kind of the aerospace awareness development exercise that we're really kind of going through right now. You know, recognizing that, you know, a lot of the kind of the roles that we see, a lot of the kind of missions uh, that we need to achieve, the state role for UTM, uh, understanding where our own fleet is, BV loss, detect and avoid, counter UAS, you know, air domain awareness, really kind of have, you know, same sort of, you uh, uh, same sort of foundational needs in terms of understanding what are the regulatory pathways for these? What are the sensor systems that we need to understand, you know, you know, develop and kind of bring on board? How to kind of bring all that data into that common operating picture? And again, particularly for this audience, how do we begin to kind of connect all that with some manner of command control architecture? So a lot of what we're thinking about is not only within those individual uh, verticals of enabling, counter, AAM, and you know, test, test facilities, but how do we also kind of bring it all together under kind of an overarching airspace awareness, particularly given the state's role is, you know, is being able to, uh, being the one to uh, support and really kind of promote aviation in Massachusetts. Um, let me kind of now go into, uh, focus a little bit on the enabling UAS. And for this, a lot of, obviously, you know, a lot of the focus is on beyond visual line of sight uh, operations for rail inspection. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Not only that, we're all, we've also uh, partnered uh, with some companies to also help us look at delivery and how we can might be able to use delivery, to, for example, to connect to uh, remote communities that say are cut off after a storm. 
the initial delivery work that I'll kind of mention on actually took place even this past uh, fall and winter. We teamed with a UK company named Skyports to just do a demonstration flight connecting Woods Hole on Cape Cod to the edge of Martha's Vineyard. We kind of flew kind of across the several days, actually several uh, 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 several different types of both water conditions and, and uh, uh, weather conditions and began to kind of demonstrate what would that look like to ourselves and to also various stakeholders, including emergency responders, that again, may have use for this. Uh, if this was kind of, you know, one of those enabling technologies, certainly the one that you know, I think uh, of, uh, is of most interest to this audience and that I, I you know, am, uh, focus on most is those BV loss operations though along the rail. And for this, we're really kind of, you know, looking to enable really those BV loss operations to, 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 to do the rail inspection across the entire network of the MBTA's commuter rail. So what I showed in kind of this map right here in those thin kind of purple lines represents the entire network, which as you can see, covers much of Eastern Massachusetts. You know, we've gone through a really kind of a series of steps over the last three years in order to kind of build upon, uh, build up our capabilities and our understanding of the mission. First off, we're actually kind of flying these rails, you know, all the time. The red lines represent actually the uh, um, uh, rail that we flew just last year. All visible line of sight, not BV loss yet, but really kind of working very closely with our MBTA partners to kind of create those baselines for you know what's uh, what's already there to help them kind of understand already you know, what is the value of the data, what's the value of the imagery, how do we begin to grow it? You know, and actually very quickly, you know, what we're really kind of focused on in terms of the mission and the use case is really vegetation management. Again, it's the initial use case. We kind of recognize that there are a lot of other uh, opportunities to do inspection, but this is kind of what we're focusing on to begin with. When the MBTA is responsible for you know tree cutting, you know, and also abiding by you know various uh, um, you know environmental laws in terms of you know operating near wetlands, how do we begin to kind of think about you know uh, how do we need to provide additional information for the MBTA for what does that actually look like? Where do they need to cut? You know, and how do they begin to kind of track that effort? You know, uh, if that was kind of the overall focus on the initial use case, you know, what we're actually kind of looking at right now is how do we begin to now identify a particular rail you know, focusing on uh, one of the rail lines, the Fitchburg commuter rail line, in order to demonstrate the initial BV loss capability. Again, this has been a very much of a uh, stepwise fashion. We actually began at, you know, small BV loss flights at a couple of other locations across Massachusetts, shown kind of in green. We had uh, small BV loss waivers at both Rockport Station right on uh, the coast, as well as air near the Devons area as well along with uh, some of the VLOS training down in our Weymouth training area. And a lot of these uh, initial flights were very short. You know, you were really using the existing tools that we had, the existing aircraft that we had. That's kind of a DJI Mavic in the background there. But really kind of training our team on the operations, kind of training our kind of our technical staff on what do we need and building a operational history to really kind of show to the FAA you know, uh, to demonstrate kind of our understanding of the constraints, our understanding of the safety case, and also things kind of build out, you know, build out the uh, waiver application. We've actually worked with a number of uh, other organizations, uh, including MITRE, uh, you know, you know, Jeff Brunig on this call and his team, as along with uh, the US DOT Volpe Center and MIT Lincoln Laboratory to help us kind of flesh out and kind of move forward with a lot of these activities. And again, really kind of, you know, pleased that we've managed just in the last month to receive our first large scale BV loss waiver covering 40 miles of the Fitchburg line uh, outside of the I-95 loop around Boston. You know, you know, this is initial, this is a very kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, initial step, still using kind of very short segments, still absolutely relying on visual observers. We do not have a detect and avoid solution yet. But, you know, it's certainly it's, you know, looking at that long linear infrastructure and also demonstrating that we can kind of fly even within controlled airspace inside of Bedford's Class D airspace. Now, this is the first step of a phased approach that we're taking to expand our capabilities. You know, what we're looking for really now is to kind of, you know, ex you know uh, identify uh, longer range aircraft. And again, you know, those longer range command and control links, which we know we're going to need. And so, again, you know, a great follow on conversation for this crowd. Uh, beyond this, then, also looking at actively exploring, exploring uh, detect and avoid architectures, really kind of moving kind of beyond the visual observer approach uh, in order to kind of have you know, more kind of electronic solution kind of over, uh, over initially the Fitchburg line, 
but again, something that is extensible that can cover really the entire commuter rail line across all of eastern Massachusetts. And that's kind of our focus on the enabling side. I'll talk briefly also about our effort on the counter UAS side as well. We recognize also very early on that, you know, force for good, but there's also a real concern about, you know, UAS flying nefariously, particularly around our airports. Everything that happened at Gatwick a number of years ago, and even some incidents in Boston, really kind of convinced a lot of the powers that be that we really need to kind of get ahead of this and begin to identify what was the role of the state in the entire kind of counter UAS mission. We understand that also, obviously, the authorities are kind of constrained, but there still is a strong role, at least to begin to understand what is flying out there and begin to kind of have that, you know, detection, uh, that detection mission that we can begin to kind of create the tools, at least that will help us a lot, that will allow us to begin to work more closely with various federal partners and with other state agencies like the state police uh, and, you know, those local airports, you know, you know lo local PDs that are really often the ones on the uh, front lines of you know the counter U.S. problem, they're the people that you know you know the pilots tend to call, the people on the ground tend to call whenever they see an errant uh, U.A.S. in the air. For this, and again, getting back to the airspace awareness uh, aspect of our work, we're beginning to develop a broader sensor suite that will begin to kind of provide us kind of the capability to kind of understand well what is in that airspace. You know, we've already actually gone ahead and kind of purchased that first infrared camera and are working with MIT Lincoln Laboratory to help repurpose a DHS uh, uh, um, emergency response tool into our Commonwealth Aerospace Information Sharing Platform, or CRIS. So in this way, really trying to understand, you know, what is that overall need? What are the various kind of, you know, you know sensor tools that we might begin to, um, you know, uh, imagine in order to kind of identify various types of drones, various types of environments? And then, you know, how do we kind of bring all that data together into a kind of a common a common system that can be shared not only obviously kind of across uh, state agencies, but with you know, not only uh, local partners, but also federal uh, you know, federal partners as well. So again, a lot of effort on the country UAS side. And very quickly to kind of wrap up at least, there's a lot of activity we're also uh, taking with regards to supporting uh, advanced air mobility. You know, Minister DiCarlo mentioned uh, mass autonomy. We're partnered with them, and they've actually set up an integration task force with a number of other stakeholders, including not only OEMs, but also real estate, you know, uh, uh, providers that are interested in kind of how they can begin to kind of, you know, use some of the lands to kind of uh, create, you know, advanced air mobility vertiports. With this integration task force, we're beginning to kind of lay out kind of a roadmap and a kind of a, you know, and a broad market study to understand how to begin to kind of really you know, support and build the AAM ecosystem here in Massachusetts. And lastly, at least I'll briefly touch on kind of that graduated system of test ranges. Uh, again, you know, for the most part, you know, my needs right now are very operational in nature. I'm looking for immediate tools that I can begin to fly in order to kind of provide value to the MBTA. But we also have a fantastic opportunity across all of Massachusetts with various partners in order to kind of begin to kind of demonstrate both developmental and operational test and evaluation. As Jeff remarked, we already kind of have Joint Base Cape Cod on the Cape, which really kind of is kind of the new air, you know, uh, uh, as part of the new air network, the FAA UAS test range. Uh, Devon's kind of in more of the central part of the state, actually is already home to the U.S. Air Force's counter UAS uh, uh, program. We're working very closely with them to understand, you know, the federal uh, the federal investment in counter UAS. But other areas, either kind of out west with UMass or even kind of closer into Boston with the Northeastern's Costas Research Institute and kind of the Autonomous Vehicle Testing Area in Boston, we'll kind of demonstrate kind of a real kind of commitment to kind of establishing a you know, broader, uh, uh, you know, a broader test infrastructure and test architecture across the state. Again, with a real uh, eye always to kind of, how do we kind of bring it in and operationalize it and kind of make it real for real customers and real, you know, real end users. So that was my very kind of quick overview of certainly uh, who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, be very happy then, I guess, to open it up uh, back to you, Brian, and open up to questions. Well, Scott and Jeff, thank you so much for that overview. Um, if anybody would anybody would like to ask a question, um, just please use that hands um, function uh, somewhere in the reactions button on, on my screen, and, and probably similar for yours as well. 
Um, I'll take moderator's prerogative and ask the first question. Um, and related to the BB loss waiver, first of all, congratulations for achieving that, um, you know, that, that initial step and in, in getting a waiver in place. And I was wondering about what lessons you learned throughout that process, um, realizing that it's still very new. Um, and also, were there any surprises or any you know, unknowns that popped up and you had to deal with uh, through getting that waiver uh, achieved? So, so I'd say certainly some of the surprises were was the level of effort and almost required at this point, you know, you know, and part of it also has to do with I think how poorly defined some of these terms um, and, and some of the kind of um, authorities really are. And even BV loss, for example, is I think you you know um, covers a very wide range of possible activities. You know, you know, I think originally we kind of had the idea of you know extended you know V loss where you kind of had visual observers. Now, you know, that term has been deprecated, and so BV loss is everything from having a visual observer's daisy chain all the way to kind of a, you know, more extensive, you know, fully um, technological detect and avoid system. That's a lot kind of under one very large umbrella. And so I think really understanding kind of how we kind of, you know, provide, how we can kind of create step-by-step -step cap capabilities uh, was kind of one challenge in which you know I think might have helped us a lot, but really understanding what does that mean to have a BV loss waiver? What does it mean for even detect and avoid has been one of the great challenges. And detect and avoid, I think, is another great example. And one thing that you know we don't have a full up detect and avoid system right now. It's something that again, you know, both MITRE and the Lincoln Laboratory are helping us develop. But you know, you know, you, you talk to a lot of um, you know, providers, a lot of vendors, that will kind of you know say that they have a full up detect and avoid system when really you know they have a sensor, which again is a key you know could be a key uh, part of a final detect and avoid solution, but you know I really kind of you have know, pushed very hard with everyone I talk to to kind of define these words for me, define what do you mean by BV loss, define what do you mean by detect and avoid, because very often you know what you're actually kind of talking about is a subset of a larger problem. Um, and kind of understanding that, understanding kind of the the boundaries has been, I think, one of our challenges. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that answer. <clears throat> Paul from Ericsson, uh, go ahead with your question, please. Yeah, hi. Thanks for a great presentation. Really comprehensive set of things you're doing. I think is is really good. So, in terms of the interactions with cellular and and five G, have you you know what what have you done so far, or what help do you need, or how can they how can we as a consortium sort of help you with that? Obviously, you know, as Ericsson as as part of the the MITRE consortium here, we're looking at um, taking taking these drone applications onto the five G for both payload and control. And so, you know, how can we help, and what's the next step for you on that? Uh, no, that, that absolutely. You know, so so right now, you know, we're really still kind of relying on a lot of the the ISM band, relying on kind of you know the, a lot of the built-in, you know, the built-in you know links, you know, with our current aircraft fleet. I need to move beyond that, and so that's what I'm looking for right now. And again, that's what certainly you know, a lot of our colleagues, you know, a lot of the people that work with at MITRE are helping us identify. You know, so I need the you know a C2 solution. That will really kind of work across that entire fairly wide, you know, geographically wide area. Although right now at least focused on the the rail network, um, that will also kind of pass FAA muster. You know, broadly speaking, you know, you know, I'm open for whatever the solutions are out there. You know, you know, if that's CNPC, if that's LTE, if that's SATCOM, bring me a solution because at the end of the day, you know, I have an operational need I'm I need to fill, and so certainly if there's a real opportunity for 5G or LTE slash 5G, you know, I am really kind of very excited and anxious to start talking with providers and really start talking also with partners who really want to start working with us and, you know, build it up here. Um, I'm also frankly looking for something that is available right now. You know, I'm not looking for a research project. I'm not looking, you know, to have a really great 5G solution that will be ready in a half, you know, year and a half or two years. I want to start talking to people now. I want to start flying really kind of as soon as I can. So that's my okay, name. That's great feedback. Thank you. Yep. If I can piggyback on one thing Scott said, you know, um, things that would provide value. We're incrementally providing um, additional value to our customers. We actually are working with customers and just, you know, the beyond visual line of sight waiver that we have right now. Um, again, not true beyond visual line of sight, not where we want to be, but it's providing value to our customers and they're willing to invest. 
um, to make sure that we can, um, uh, you know, uh, execute operations that ensure safety, um, allow them to do state of good repair efforts and the like. So um, as we move forward, what we're, we're really looking at continuing to build on that. And so that will be also, I mean, that will be, frankly, my question to, you know, the entire audience here. You know, what are my options? Obviously, this is the 5G continuum, you know, you know, consortium. You know, you know, where, you know, my question to all of you is, where does 5G stand right now? And again, I also do have multiple missions. Obviously, I'm most focused right now on, you know, BB loss command and control, but I still also have that emergency response mission for which, you know, I really am looking for better ways in order to kind of, you know, live stream, you know, uh, you know, uh, incident, you know, you know, incident video to command posts at various levels across various communities with various sorts of, you know, state organizations. So, you know, for a couple of missions that I have, uh, I'm very interested in understanding you know, where is 5G today, and what sort of, you know, what sort of capabilities do you have that, you know, I can begin to use, you know, tomorrow. I'll throw that out there to to the audience. Does, does anybody want to take that question? That's that's almost a softball question for this. It is. I hope it's a softball question. But again, it's one that I'm really kind of you know I'm trying to kind of understand you know, what are the bounds you know and what are the, what's the real trade space right now. Anybody from the equipment side or the the network side want to take that? Paul, you turned on your camera, so I'm wondering if you're ready uh, too to soon. Go. Apparently, I was just seeing if anyone else is volunteering for an answer for that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say you know we're we're still uh, you know, we've we've uh, come a long way in terms of cellular support of drones from the early days of LTE and what LTE can do or 4G can do for for, for command and control and payload. And now, if like in this consortium, we're sort of focusing on. On 5G, I mean, 5G has some better mechanisms for beam steering, and the radio parts of 5G will help the the, the UAS world. And so we're working now establishing test capabilities and test ranges where we can prove out the reliability and security of the C2 link, the the um, and then having the best capability for payload and the highest highest definition videos and the, the highest capabilities we can on the on the payload side on the on the data payload if you like and so i think we made some good good strides we're now looking at you know how do we build corridors how do we fly us is like a longer way in terms of where you have to hand over between cells there's the complexity of course of having to need a spectrum associated with this and so then that brings in the operator community we have verizon on the call here and and other operators that can provide that and so I think we're at a you know good spot to to engage. I think we have the 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 devices are there, we have network capabilities, and I think you know with a bit of help from the FAA, you know I think we're all the ingredients are sort of coalescing to to have a sort of a a really good um, set of solutions around around five G for for US. And I think you know as a consortium we can engage with you to to sort of talk in more detail about how that would actually practically play out. But I think all the pieces are there, and we're characterizing and and learning. Uh, to be able to say, I mean, one one thing is okay. I'm flying. I'm doing a one UAS flight over this distance is one thing, but to be able to do tens of thousands of those, to be able to do it reliably, highly securely, uh, you know, and every you know, weather conditions, all these things. I mean, that's that's what we're working to to sort of paint the operational envelope of that and and what 5G has to to offer there, which I think is 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 pretty good. And we're looking at um, you know the mass commercialization of US on on 5G network. And we have a vision of uh, tens of thousands of US is flying across the country, delivering and helping emergency services. I mean, this is this is a massive opportunity on a national level to do this. We're just sort of we're edging towards it. We're going a bit too too slowly. I mean, we caution is good. You know, we have to respect safety, but it feels like the technology is there. That I don't see that as the limit. Now it's like we need to work on real life use cases, a bit more of the characterization, but uh, certainly would like to, to I think you, your environment you have there, I think is great because you have real life use cases that you're doing today that you can, as you go, as you extend the BV loss needs there, then the cellular world can help even more. Uh, you start to hit the limits of ISM band. You start to you have radio limits there, and then 5G can pick up from there and take that onto a, a mass market, high high mobility, high reliability environment. So, I think um, you know we're in a we're a good uh, situation to be able to help. You know, I think you're, you've got a great uh, kind of variety of, of of demands there, and we can help meet those. Right, great. I don't know if my, my, any of my colleagues want to add to that answer. That was my first stab. 
Leila, I, I see you turning your camera on. Yeah, sorry, my, my camera is on the laptop today, and so it's a little bit off angle. But uh, yeah, so I just a great answer from Paul, I would say, start saying. And uh, I yes, the elements out are there. The technology is there now. What we are doing and what uh, the opportunity that you have right now at uh, your 40 mile, uh, uh, let's say, waiver uh, railroad, it's great because it's the it, that's a great, big opportunity to collect data to provide additional data on how that performs. So one thing I would like to add is that uh, uh, LTE be a start. So you can think, as you said, uh, LTE slash 5G. You know, it, it, I mean, one thing would be to look at that uh, uh, that 40 mile portion and see what is there in terms of uh, coverage uh, to start with, and then go from there in terms of uh, 5G. Of course, you would need to equip your uh, drones and so on, but as Paul said, the the radios are there, you know, the, the equipment exists today, and we have been uh, implementing solutions to integrate uh, 5G on drones, and, uh, and so there are, there are all the components are there, so I think this, this is a great opportunity. And certainly, I kind of, you know, uh, certainly hope that being, you know, frankly, Eastern Massachusetts, fairly metropolitan area, you know, covering the you know, commuter rail lines where those commuters, you know, pretty much demand that they have cell signal you know, along the entire way means I would hope that it's a fairly uh, low lift to, you know, have coverage or kind of, you know, you know, identify that there's coverage, you know, in those areas that we're currently focusing on. Um, so, yeah, that, that's certainly you know, the first thing I'm interested in. You know, what are the you know, what are those options? You know, what is kind of the strength and cross not even only the 40, but I'm also absolutely looking to expand across that entire commuter, commuter rail network, obviously kind of starting on that one Fitchburg commuter rail line. Um, the other kind of big question I'm going to have, though, is kind of, you know, what, you know, what does this audience think about in terms of the types of partnerships? You know, because I'm absolutely looking for someone that, yes, can, you know, you know, sell me that little, you know, radio or modem to put in my aircraft and, you know, have one on the ground. But what does that connectivity overall look like? And what does the partnership look like between, you know, that's, you know, what I'll call the C2, the communications provider, between the aircraft provider, between us as really kind of the enterprise operator, as well as kind of with, you know, your miters, you know, and your Lincoln laboratories that are supporting us in various ways. Understanding how that would look, particularly with a very strong eye toward, you know, really kind of, you know, developing, you know, uh, you know, uh, exciting, more, you know, innovative solutions that we can begin to kind of talk about to the rest of the you know, nation is something I'm really interested in as well. And that maybe is kind of also more appropriate for, you know, following conversations, but that's something that I, you know, I'm interested in. What do those, what do partnerships even look like with, you know, the, the, the people on this call? Does anybody want to take that on? I know Rick Niles, you might have some uh, some thoughts on that. Um, well, let's see. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of partnerships that could could happen. Um, I, I think there, uh, you know, like you said in your previous question, um, we have to determine exactly what the coverage uh, is available. One of the things that we've also looked into is the, is the spectrum requirements. You know, some some of the spectrum is allowed to be used for aviation, and some isn't. But I think that's easily determined and uh, and you can get services that are specific for aviation for 5G, that's not a problem. Um, and, you know, I, I one of the things um, I would add is, uh, you know, right now we're at NSA, which is non-standalone, where you're going to have a LTE link and then you're going to have a 5G bearer, but uh, you're still going to get a lot of the benefits of 5G with that extra bandwidth and capability and performance, and, and that's available today. And, uh, you know, in the near future, hopefully uh, some uh, carriers will start moving to standalone mode and then you'll get even more benefits. So um, I, I think there's a lot of benefits there. And I think, um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of partners in the consortium you can work with. I think you already have a huge list of partners that uh, you briefed us on today. So I think there's a lot of potential here to, to bring telecom and um, the UAS community together further. And just going back and looking at the map on one of your first slides, I mean, what a rich set of resources from use cases, from rail to sea to 
to all the observing, emergency management, et cetera, right in Massachusetts, um, plus all of the aviation facilities, plus all of the research and you know operational organizations um, that you have right in the Bay State is um, is quite tremendous. So. Um, Yes, so yeah. I think it's it's great to be able to put all all of that together, plus all of um, what's happening now. And I think from the open gen consortium side, is you know we're kind of learning this too. This is something very new, getting the the five G modems and everything working on the on the small aircraft as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and to that point, yeah. Obviously, when you take a look at those delivery demos that we were doing last year, you know, we are looking to kind of expand the types of operations that we're able to enable. Looking for more partners, you know, you know, across uh, those other use cases, those other missions, you know. So the nice thing about kind of focusing right now on the rail mission is, again, we have a customer, we have someone that's already kind of looking for us, kind of fly for them, and so we're really, you know, really kind of identifying that as kind of our initial focus. Let's kind of identify how we can kind of bring together, you know, new, you know, communication over those commuter rail lines. Ultimately, bring together, you know, new detect and avoid services across those lines. But at the end of the day, I'm also looking for extensible, scalable solutions. I mean, to some extent, you know, you know, I occasionally chat with some of the uh, people in the FAA, you know, beyond office. You know, you know, the idea that they're focused on, you know, economic viability, on scalability. That's the language that we've been speaking since from the very beginning. And so, yes, I want to start looking at those rail. But next thing I want to do is want to continue those delivery operations off the coast. We're kind of crossing the water to the communities that might be cut off. I want to start looking at Western Massachusetts, you know, you know, uh, over the Berkshires, where, and frankly, you know, the, even the LTE coverage is not as good as where you're going to have in the greater Boston area. You know, there are a lot of other areas we can begin to kind of uh, grow into. And I'm also looking for, you know, partners that, you know, are excited about growth, want to see that kind of growth happen as well. But again, you know, a great place to begin where you can have, you know, a geographic area, you know, defined mission, and, you know, and real partners ready today. I'll bring that map back. It's a good map. All right, thank you. And Ken Stewart from New Air, uh, go ahead with the, with your question, please. Yeah, hey Jeff, hey Scott, hey thanks guys, great presentation. Got my question is actually really kind of in support of what Mass Dot's talking about, but directed more towards a broader audience. So, uh, what Scott said is something we've been talking about for a long time: is what's economically viable. And so, Scott, you had some of the operations that you did for like off of Massport, off of Logan, kind of simulating a, an accident. So we talk a lot about C2. C2 is obviously important command and control, but you know, if you're gonna stream this type of high def or LIDAR or any of this type of data, if you're gonna stream that real time, that's really a capacity and, and bandwidth issue. And so um, in some cases that could actually be more important than the command and control. You know, the robots are pretty smart about staying where they're located. But what are some of the options that some of the broader audience here can bring back to organizations like MassDOT or even, even New Air to start understanding how we can bring an economically viable solution for these types of things? If you're streaming, you know, emergency back to a data center or an, or an operation center, you might be streaming that out to five or six different, different customers simultaneously. That is a massive challenge for this industry today. And, and what are some of the solutions we could look for there? Yes, can I add one point to uh, uh, Ken's comment? I, I, I really agree that the importance, so the advantage, for instance, of the big volume from 5G is not only for C2, it's also for the, the payload, for the mission data, right? And so that is, uh, the, the, to, the, to, to his point, it may be the difference that justifies uh, like a business case for cer for certain uh, for, for certain use cases. Uh, that's that's one thing for sure. So we are, uh, and I'm just trying to touch a little bit on your question on partnership as well. That's what we are, let's say, trying to do. This group that you're talking to today is trying to to do exactly that to get together to answer some of those questions. So we are what the. Uh, what we are doing in Open Day with the scenarios, the use cases that we identified and the, the scenarios of uh, using 5G for both C2 and for uh, the mission data is exactly to get understand better what, how it performs, to understand better what are the best configurations to, to get the best performance, how what are the new capabilities that would make it perform even better and so on. So 
uh, all of those would be applicable to your uh, use cases or to a subset of your sub case, your use cases in, in this scenario. So I see there is a good fit for that partnership or like a, in terms of a, a, a joining forces or collaborating here. Yeah, I, I would love to you know, hear good, great answers to Ken's question. You know, understanding those capabilities, uh, I think it's kind of central to what we're we've been trying to do certainly on the you know on the mass dot team, uh, and really again kind of being the one to kind of roll them out. You know, uh, I think the you know the advantage of you know the state taking on all this is that to some extent we are able to kind of you know dive into some of these technologies for which you know the market is still kind of maturing. You know, you know, you know, trying to provide you know you know uh, a real capability to state agencies that have an immediate need. You know, let's kind of get it out there. Let's kind of get it, you know, uh, in, in trials and kind of demonstrate the capability. You know, certainly, you know, so that as the market begins to kind of mature and kind of sees that all right, you know, all this is kind of ready to go, particularly on the regulatory aspect, which we all know is kind of the greatest challenge right now. You know, hopefully, you know, by the state's activities. We can begin to kind of you know push this forward and really kind of you know enable the entire industry to kind of you know blossom after that. I mean exactly what you know Ken's trying to do in the center of New York R and D, and you know what we're trying to do kind of in Massachusetts very much you know with the uh, operator operations in mind. And to that end, have you had other states or regions reach out to you looking for lessons that you've learned or helping maybe even to share their experiences with you? We've talked to a number of states. You know, they tend to be kind of you know you know you know, uh, you know off, off you know, one-off conversations. Certainly, you know, we've been talking to New Air for years now. I mean, from the very you know beginning, we were very kind of closely you know, uh, allied with New Air. You know, you know, our our MITRE colleagues work very closely with North Dakota, and so we're actually act very actively tracking what North Dakota is developing. But you look at all the IPP and all the now beyond participants. I think we still have kind of a, you know a ton to learn from all of them. You know, North Carolina, Virginia has done some great work with you know UTM uh, solutions. Um, you know, certainly what we're trying, what we're really kind of positioning ourselves uh, with is being those op you know being the operator, being the one that really is kind of taking it and really kind of pushing it immediately to kind of providing it that real immediate value to kind of our end customers. The other thing that I think that we are really kind of focusing on is also that counter UES piece. That you know, you know, I think we're also you know starting to kind of you know take a leadership position and understanding you know and to help define what is the role of the state for counter UAS. You know, that's one where I think there's a lot of questions, certainly from the federal, state, you know, local responsibilities, federal, state, local authorities. Que you know, question. We're really trying to position ourselves to kind of understand, you know, again, how do they all kind of communicate with each other? What types of information can we collect? What types of kind of actions can we take right now, even if those actions are kind of limited to, you know, you know, you know, find the kid and tell them to you know, you know, cut it off, you know, you know, buzz, buzzing Fenway or somewhat. So you know, these are some of the areas where uh, we're starting to kind of have those conversations uh, and really kind of continuing the uh, continuing the discussion. Certainly, a lot of conversations with all of our fellow New England states and Northeast states, you know, even just purely on an operations level. I think we chat with you know, you know, you know, New England, uh, UAS, you know. Um, you know, operators, maybe twice a year at least, you know, sharing kind of best practices. Thank you. And Leila from Ingenuity, uh, go ahead, please. Just a quick question. Actually, I had this question uh, written here that I wanted to, when, when I heard you talking about looking at different different options, for instance, for C2 like CMPC, LTE slash 5G and SATCOM, how are you planning to Let's say to assess those. Are you planning to let's say to to implement all of them and the benchmark? What can you say a little bit more about that? So as with everything, you know, being the state, you know, there's always a requirements process, you know, requirements and procurement process to go through. You know, a lot of my requirements are going to be very operationally driven, and so at the end of the day, you know, you know, I know where I need to fly. You know, I certainly know the types of operations I need to enable. And obviously, I need to kind of get all that through the FAA and potentially FCC, you know, regulatory authorities that allow me to fly that. And so, at the end of the day, you know, uh, I'm not a communications me. You know, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily kind of speak, you know, 4G, LTE, or 5G or anything. 
Um, so I'll be looking obviously to many of our MITRE partners to kind of help me understand that from a purely technical perspective. But again, you know, I'm looking to evaluate things based on, you know, you know, who wants to stand up and kind of really kind of partner with us and work with us to kind of, you know, push for that kind of immediate operational capability, uh, but then also kind of continue to kind of build out after that. So I think that's how, you know, that's going to be a lot of the lenses that we look to as we kind of figure out what's the best path forward. And, and Layla, I will say that that's where mass autonomy comes into play because I, I don't really know the requirements yet. So if we have folks that want to partner, um, you know, our industry nonprofit can bring together industry, academia and government to do some really interesting thing, including some challenges and the like. Because once we get into direct contact with individual partners, the procurement, um, uh, you know, uh, can be impacted in the future. So. But not only that, we just we really want to understand what the trade space is out there and what the requirements are. And we are doing that now. So a lot of times, um, a lot of the folks that want to partner with us, I, you know, mass autonomy is the place to go. Be, and we're doing that with advanced air mobility. And then moving forward, um, we want to do that more broadly. So that's going to be the key for us um, as we continue to work concurrently uh, with our partners, MITRE, Lincoln Lab, Volpe, and um, academia as well. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you again. I guess one final question and kind of sum things up. What What is your greatest challenge in moving forward, especially with the BV loss? Is it um, in, over, over wide networks? Is it the equipment on the aircraft? Is it the network availability? Um, I guess, and very briefly, what is, um, what is the biggest challenge that you see? So for me, I would say it's the uncertainty in the regulatory pathway. You know, I have, you know, at this point, a fairly clear, somewhat clear idea of the trade space for C2 solutions, at least in you know, the first order. I have a pretty kind of clear understanding of the pathway toward, a, you know, the technical detect and avoid solutions. I have a kind of clear pathway for what those operations are going to look like. Um, my greatest challenge, particularly with the state, it's trying to kind of identify, you know, very near term value is what is the regulatory barrier? What regulatory barriers am I going to hit? It's going to slow me down. And even worse, it's going to kind of provide an, uncer an uncertainty to, uh, you know, my end users. Um, obviously, a very kind of slow pathway is kind of how we are dealing with that. You know, this 40 mile corridor is really, you know, something that we're extraordinarily proud about. Technologically, it still is VOs. We want to do more. But it definitely kind of demonstrates some real kind of, you know, uh, regulatory robustness and maturity in our program. But again, going beyond that and exactly what sort of barriers I'm going to hit and how that's going to affect my timeline, that's what I worry about. And so certainly I'm very, very excited and, uh, and anxious to see what comes out of the FAA's BV loss arc uh, recommendations and, you know, how will the B, you know, FAA really begin to kind of move forward and hopefully streamline a lot of these, you know, areas such as, you know, airworthiness criteria, you know, um, uh, detect and avoid, you know, evaluations. What is that going to look like? So that's my, uh, my, that's my biggest worry. Excellent. So yeah, the regular regulatory side is uh, certainly evolving and we're keeping in, in close touch with um, colleagues down working at the FAA integration office and, and beyond. Well, Jeff, Scott, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you for a really engaging conversation about all of the, the really progressive uh, UAS activities taking place in the Bay State. We certainly appreciate it. And with that, I would like to close out our meeting. Um, please stay tuned for announcements mm -hmm. on future government, re, uh, government roundtable uh, meetings as well from MITRE Ingenuity Open Generation Consortium. Take care and have a good afternoon. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you.